Do it. You're working on it, huh? All right. Hey, uh, kids, it's time for you to head on out to uh, Junior Church. So if you'll slide out the door, and uh, you're going to go get discipled is what's going to happen to you. And uh, so if you will, just make your way on out, and uh, they will be ministering to you. Thank you so much. The rest of you, grab your Bible, if you will, and open it up to the book of Jude. Now, I know what you're thinking. Jude, what? Where the heck is that? It's right before Revelation, and it's only one chapter. So you know that because it's only one chapter, the sermon won't be too long. He, he won't be tempted to keep on going and keep on going, right? Uh, we're in a series that we've been doing right now on our pillars. Uh, they are the thing that makes the foundation of what we're doing as a church. And it's very important that you understand what these are about, and where we're going as a church. And I'm going to list the three of the five pillars as we go on in this series. We're at number three right now. But you remember the very first one was unashamed adoration, that we were not afraid to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to lift up his name and to praise his name. In a day and a time in which we live in where secular music has invaded even the church, they don't even sing songs unto God anymore, breaks my heart, but we are never going to be that as a church. We are going to adore Jesus and worship him. That's what we're here for. The other, our second pillar is unapologetic preaching. That is, we believe in proclaiming the word of God without apology. In a day and age where our society around us is telling us what we can say and what we cannot say, we're going to say what the Word of God says. And I'm sure there's going to be a time when the government says, you can't say that. Mark it down. We're going to say it. And if they come and they throw Gus in jail, let them throw Gus in jail. It's okay with me. I'll visit you on a regular basis, my brother. But yeah, yeah. It'll be incredible, it won't it? But that's what we're here for, unapologetically to preach the Word of God. And then thirdly, as our third foundation, is unceasing prayer. Prayer is so vital to the Christian life. It is the breathing in and the breathing out of our relationship with the Lord. To always be in unceasing prayer. This is what we're called to do as His people. And today, I want to stoke the fire, if you will. I want to put wind on the fire and create that flame going, because this is, what, this is what I know happens. Of all of the dynamics within our Christian life, it's as if prayer can flicker and wane so easily. It can be the very thing that is so vital to everything that we do, And at the same time that it's vital, it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable because so many times good things in life crowd out the best things in life. And we need to be reminded to pray. And so we are going to call this our third pillar, that we unceasingly pray. We believe in the power of prayer. And we can go to God at any time breathing in his grace and breathing out trust, breathing in his grace and breathing out his trust. Lord, we are here for you. And I want to see in our church, in our private times, prayer enhanced. I want to see it at family meals when we're praying together. I want to see husbands and wives pray together. I want to see roommates and friends. I want to see in small groups. I want to see times when the church gathers together where we're lifting up our Lord and we're praying as if we've never prayed before. It is vital to our Christian experience. So with your mind geared towards prayer and your heart in tune, let's look at God's word beginning in Jude verse 17. There's only one chapter, so we just say Jude 17. Listen to this. I'm going to read the entire context. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause division, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and watch it, 
praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life. Verse 22, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And listen to verse 24 and 25. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Woo. If that doesn't get you excited, nothing will get you excited, right? That just, I love that. But our focus this morning on prayer is going to be right here, this idea of waiting on the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, keeping ourselves in the love of God, and he's going to tell us how, and that is by praying in the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about what that means today, and we're not just going to talk about it, but we're going to actually put it in action today, and I will tell you just exactly some great things that God is doing. But I want to ask you this question, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? Now, the moment I say that, there can be a guilt feeling that comes over us because it's like, well, we never pray enough, right? I mean, that's like asking me on the scale of 1 to 10, how spiritual are you? Well, no one's ever going to say a 10, right? Because the moment you say a 10, you're not humble. You're proud, and that's a sin. So you get knocked down a notch for that. So we got to be careful here. I don't want to heap guilt on you, but what I am saying is this. For the Christian, there should be an ever-growing, increasing amount of time that we spend in prayer, unceasingly pray, and why? Because prayer is the very life of God at work in us. We're breathing in His grace. We're breathing out trust. We're breathing in grace in His Word, and we're trusting Him. And if you don't breathe, you know what happens. You die. And so prayer is a vital part of our life. Now, what do you pray for the most? Most of the times we pray for things that we hope for, like I'm sick, help me get better, right? We're going to pray for worku. We have no idea what God is going to do, but we're going to pray in faith that God heals that man. And we're going to ask the Lord for healing upon him. And we are going to say, Lord, we're going to read from your word. The word of God says, you call the elders of the church. You anoint that man with oil. You lay hands on him and the prayer of faith brings about healing. Amen. And so we're going to trust God's word. But what is the one thing that you pray for? I guess when you ask me that question, other than the salvation of my kids And all my kids know the Lord. And now I pray for the salvation of my grandkids. I'm a young grandfather. I just want to emphasize that. (laughs) It's a miracle that at my age I should have grandkids, but I do. And I pray for those three kids every single day. Father, as soon as they're able to understand your love and your grace, save them. Save them. Oh God, please, that's a prayer of mine. But more than that, The one prayer that I suppose I've prayed for over 35 years of ministry has been this prayer. It's been the prayer of my life. And if you stop and think about your life, you've got a lifelong prayer too. What is it? And do you continue to pray it? My prayer is this. Father, I love nothing more than to preach your word and teach and feed your sheep. Allow me, Father, please, in your grace, give me the truth for your sheep and help me, Father, be the kind of shepherd that brings you great glory. May they see Christ, Father, from your word. May they see how precious you are and may they become worshipers of you. That is my lifelong pray. I pray that every day. I pray that while I'm sitting there when we're worshiping. Father, help me. I'm about ready to get up and teach your eternal breath. 
I'm about to de declare who you are, Father. Give me the words to say. Give me the thoughts I need. Oh, Father, bless me. Please give unto me. May your spirit be found in me. And Father, may rivers of living water flow by the power of the Spirit. Amen. That's my prayer. And, and you know what? I'm not really interested in being around one day longer if it means that I don't get to do that. I'm not saying that I have to always be a pastor, but I need to always shepherd the souls of people and teach and preach the Word of God. And Lord, when you're done with me, let's get out of here. Let, take me home. Gus can take over. He can do it. He's, he, he knows exactly what to do. And, and he can do my service. Now, I know he thinks it's going to be the reverse situation. But you never know. Anyway, you get the passion of my heart. You get to understand a little bit about what makes me tick. And you know what? There is something in you as well that you pray, what is it? I want you to think about this this week. I want you to think about the unceasing prayer. I hope you have a plan. And I hope that you embrace breathing in and breathing out. Now... I want us to look at this passage of Scripture because this is very significant. I want you to understand, first of all, the main verb here. Notice what he says, verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. So if you're saved, if you're a believer, Jude wants you to be built up. And he says, building yourselves up. This is something that you're going to do. This is an action on your part as a Christian. Building up your faith. Here it is. How do we do that? Praying in the Holy Spirit, and here's the main verb, keep yourself in the love of God. So Jude is saying here, when it comes to your Christian life, there's an aspect of your life that is dependent upon you. Now, I'll clarify this a little bit because we're going to be talking about what is the means of grace. And I know that's a word that you may not be used to. It's a theological term. But it simply means how God displays his grace in your life. And one of the ways that God displays his grace is that you take action as a believer. For instance, Christ died on the cross for your sins. That's what the Word of God says. But the Word of God also says that you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead, and then, the Bible says, you shall be saved. So the death of Jesus Christ is the decisive work of God. The dependent work of you is to confess and to believe and to trust in Him. And they go together. Now, the decisive work of God is sovereign in all things, even in our salvation. But we must participate in the outcome of our faith. This is what the Word of God means when it says and when it talks about perseverance. We are saying this. We are saying, Lord, I love you and I demonstrate my love for you in my obedience. And the obedience confirms the fact that I truly am saved. So there's a decisive work of God where he redeems you and saves you, and there's a dependent work where you continually obey, read scripture, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You pray. What are you doing? You are confirming the decisive work of God in a beautiful symmetry that goes together, and it's called we perseverance, that we stick together and we hang together with God because he loves us. That's what this little book of Jude is all about. It's about perseverance. Now, notice what he says. He says, praying in the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about what that means, but we keep ourselves in the love of God. Wow. That is powerful. So how do we do that? And what happens here? Now, this is important. Go up to verse 1. Jude chapter 1. There's no chapter. It's just Jude. Verse 1. And watch this. Here it comes. So I'm going to explain to you the dependency that we have on God through prayer, praying in the Spirit, and also his decisiveness. And here it is. Look at Jude. 
verse 1, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God, and watch this, in God the Father, and what? Kept for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is interesting, because this is a passive verb. And a passive verb means you're not doing the action, the action's being done by somebody else. And what Jude is saying here is this. First of all, the decisive work of God is that you are kept by God. God saved you, God redeems you, God keeps you. That's what the Word says. Now, the dependent work of God is because He keeps me, because He saves me, because He redeems me, I continue to follow him in obedience, and one of the things that I follow him in is my prayer life. It is of vital importance. That's why he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. How do I do that? By praying in the Spirit. So you see how they go together. I'm tired of this mechanical Christianity that says, I prayed a prayer, I filled out a card, I went forward, I said, I want to believe in Jesus, and now for the rest of my life, I'm going to live like hell. And, and I don't have to worry about anything because I got Jesus. And there is never a display of Christ at all in your life. If that's how you think of Christianity, you're malfunctioning. It doesn't work that way. You say, Pastor Mike, don't you believe in eternal security? Yes, I do. In fact, you are saved. Jesus has you in his hand, and the Father has Jesus in his hand, and you shall never go if you are truly a believer of his. But it also means this, that there'll also be fruit that comes from my life on a daily basis. There will be a change that happens. There will be a manifestation of God in me and I will continually grow. And one of the expressions of that growth is prayer. Why? Because I'm communing with God. I'm praying day in. I'm praying day out. I'm breathing in His Word. I'm breathing in grace and trusting in Him in everything that I do. That's what God calls me to do. In fact, look at here who keeps you. And this is interesting because it says, kept for Jesus Christ. It's a little bit ambiguous in the Greek text because it can mean by, or with, or to, or for, but the ESV translators have translated it kept for Jesus Christ because of the doxology at the end. Drop down to verse 24, look at it. Now unto him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Who is the him? Look at it, verse 25 to the only God, our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So it is the Father, through the work of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit that retains you and keeps you from stumbling, keeps you from falling away from His grace. Somebody said to me, I think I read it in a commentator, they said this, it's hard to fall when you're on your knees. I thought, wow, that's good. When I'm doing things on my own, I fall a lot, especially at my age. (laughs) I have a staircase in my house, and I grab onto the railing because I don't trust myself. I don't trust. I got a knee that's a little funny, and I've had that thing go out, and I, boom, gone down the staircase, and it didn't feel good. It hurt in a lot of places. But the truth is this. Instead of walking, if we spent more time maybe on our knees, we wouldn't stumble as much. And so here we have a powerful reminder that it's God's sustaining grace, that it's God's means by which his grace comes to you. That's what I mean by the means of grace. We're saying, how does God's grace come to you? The means by which his grace comes to you, one of those means is prayer. Do you understand me, church? Am I making sense? In fact, if you look at our pillars, here's every one of them who are exactly what we're supposed to be doing according to the Word of God, and they're all means of grace. In other words, if I am a believer, I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship Jesus. 
You can't be a believer in Christ and never worship the Lord. You can't be a believer and not sit under the teaching of the Word of God. You can't be a believer and never commune with God in prayer. It won't work. You have to be dependent upon what the Lord has done for you in salvation. You need to worship Him. You need to sit under the preaching of the Word of God, and you need to be praying. I have a family member who he tells me he's a believer. And uh, he was telling me he's a believer. And I said, that's wonderful. Uh, I don't see much evidence in his life, so I just asked him a few questions about the means of grace. I said, how is your prayer life? Oh, well, you know, I, uh, you know, well, on special occasions when we have the whole family together, we pray. I said, okay, well, we need to do better than that. I said, um, how about going to church and worshiping the Lord? Well, we haven't found a church that we like. Well, there's got to be some church where you are, where they're worshiping God. And I want to say this, you need to be there worshiping the Lord. You need to be there sitting under the authoritative preaching of God's word. Find a church somewhere where they love God and where they teach his word and they believe in prayer and go there. Well, it's just, you know, it's really hard these days to find a good place to go. And I just, I really try, I said, let me ask you one more. I said, how about giving? You know, these are all the means by which God expresses his love and grace. Not legalism, but but do you give unto the Lord as an act of worship? Total silence. Nothing. I'm saying, look, you're telling me that God has decisively saved you, and yet there's no manifestation of his grace in your life. I am concerned for you. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not your judge. That's not my job. My job is to tell you what the Word of God says, and the Word of God says that there should be fruit in your life. And how God's grace comes to us is when we practice in obedience the very means of grace, the very things He's given unto us to enjoy Him. You see, prayer is not a burden, my friends. Worshiping God is not a burden. Listening to the word of God being preached is not a burden. It is a joy. It's what you were created for. It's what you were made for. And if God is alive in you, then that will be proclaimed and you will see transformation in your life. And That's why he says, build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and this sustains you, this keeps you in the love of God. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus taught when he was with his disciples teaching in the last days. He said this, keep on alert at all times. What are you supposed to be doing? Praying. Praying that you have, may have strength to escape all these things that he's talking about that are about to take place. And notice this, and to stand before the Son of Man. So every day I am praying I am saying, Lord, guide, direct, lead me. I'm worshiping you. I love you. Give me guidance. Help me in all things, Father. This is what I want to do. This is what I love to do because I belong to you. And so praying for me is not a legalistic thing, even though I keep a list. The list just helps this thing up here called my mind that forgets. And every time and every day and where I'm traveling, I often turn off the radio in the car and I just pray, Father, thank you for saving me. Father, I love you. Father, let me shepherd your people today. Father, teach me your word today. Father, let me be a help to somebody today. May they see how beautiful Christ is. And if it's your will and your glory and your privilege that I would have the opportunity to to show somebody the way to Christ, would you do that today, Father? And I just pray that over and over and all the time. And whatever God has shaped your heart for and molded you for and created you for, you are going to see that burden in your heart and the prayer of your soul expressed. That's what prayer is all about. And so you must pray. In fact, he even tells this to Peter. 
Peter was going to stumble. Peter was going to fall. Peter was not going to finally fall, Jesus tells him, but he is going to stumble. And he says this, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Oh, what a beautiful passage of Scripture because we've all fallen. At times, we've all stumbled. And it's so beautiful when somebody comes along and gives us strength and prays for us. Be praying for one another. Pray for each other. Lift each other up. When a brother and sister in Christ says, I need prayer or I need help, stop what you're doing right there and pray for them. Pray for them. This is what we're doing. Now, he's going to tell us something that's really powerful here. And watch this. He's going to say, pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does he mean by that? Let me just give you a little, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the meaning because I want to get to the how. You read commentators, commentators tell you often the meaning of the text. And it's important and it's significant, but they never get to the how. And theologians who are great men of God, who study the word of God, who know the languages far better than we and tell us what the text means, sometimes I get real frustrated with them because they don't tell me how. It's not just what does it mean, but is how do I do that? How do I pray in the Spirit? What does it mean, and how do I do it? Let me just give you a real quick synopsis. I think that what he's talking about here is prayer in the Holy Spirit is the enabling power of the Spirit of God in your life to motivate you, to enable you, and to energize you in prayer. In other words, when I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm asking God for guidance. God, help me even pray what I don't know what I should be praying for. And and guide me, Lord, because at times I don't know where I'm going or what to do. And not only that, I'm asking you, Lord, for your direction. This is what I want. Now, Some people, when they look at this phrase, praying in the Spirit, think that it's talking about speaking in tongues. I don't think it's a reference in here. She said, Pastor Mike, do you believe in speaking in tongues? Yes, I do. I, I, I didn't get that gift, but I do believe that it's a valid gift. And the reason why I don't think he's talking about speaking in tongues here is because he's saying pray in the Holy Spirit. He is telling everyone this is how you are kept in the faith. It's part of the means of grace. And since you all did not gift the gift of speaking in tongues, it doesn't make any sense that he is saying to only those who speak in tongues, exercise your gift and you persevere in your salvation. The rest of you, you're kind of out of luck. So it doesn't mean that. In fact, I liken it to Ephesians 6.18. Watch this. Praying at all times. Right? How? In the Spirit. With all prayer and supplication. And notice that, to that end, keep alert with all what? Person. Doesn't that just sound like what we read in Jude? It is. And so the praying in the Spirit here is to be absolutely dependent. I love this in Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. I I, I got a chance to go up. Thank you so much for allowing me to be gone last week. Thank you, Sven, for preaching. I got a chance to go up and see my mom. And she's in a, a care facility, a private home. There's only three other ladies there. And on uh, Sunday night, I got a chance to say goodbye to my mom. And my mom is slowly fading. She's not that old. She's only 82. So if you're in your 80s, you're not that old. However, if you're 90, you are way up there. <laughs> and I, I told my mom, I said, Mom, I love you. I want to thank you for taking care of us kids. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. There was a time when my biological father walked out on her and it was her and me and my brother and that was it. And during that time, she came to know Christ as her Savior. And God began to bless in incredible ways. It's another story, but I just wanted to thank my mom for being faithful in that time and sustaining us through the power of God's grace by praying for us as kids. And I'm praying for my mom, and I see my mom. Her memory is starting to slowly fade away. She, 
She has delusional thoughts. She has weird stuff going on in her head. So it, it, it's such a bizarre place to be because you can talk to her about an event in her life and it's like she has perfect clarity and then you start talking about something that happened yesterday and it is like, what are you talking about? It's hard, it's sad. And I didn't know how to pray. And I stood there and I said, Father, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. Do, do I pray, Father, that you heal my mother of, of all of this and allow her to do the things she used to do to be able to walk, to be able to drive, to be able to visit the grandkids and the great-grandchildren? Or, Lord, do I, do I say, just give her comfort in her last days? Do, do I say, Lord, her time is done don't allow her to stay here any longer and suffer. If it's your will, would you, only in your will and your grace, if you want to take her home, would you do that graciously? And so as I was praying, I just thought of this verse, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but watch this. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. Isn't that good? That's praying in the Spirit. He enables our prayers, and it says, with groanings too deep for words. In fact, everything in our life is by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. We put to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit. We say Jesus is Lord by the Spirit. We worship the Lord by the Spirit. He enables. I know that I cannot preach I cannot pastor, I cannot teach without the enabling power of the Spirit and to be dependent upon Him every moment, every day, for every ounce of strength that we have that I might accomplish what He wants me to do. And then, Lord, when I'm done with my task, when I'm done with the work that You have me, just take me home. Just take me to glory, Father. I want to be with You. And in that day, Father, You keep me going until I can't go anymore, and then take me. And I pray that. And I ask the Lord for my mom that you would do what you would do in your will, Lord. Heal her if that's your will. If it's your will, take her to glory. But this is my prayer. Am I making sense, church? Are you understanding my heart? Have you been there? Do you know at times we don't know what to pray? Pray in the Spirit, which means we're trusting Him. We're asking Him to be our guide, our motivator, and our director for everything in life. After I was done visiting my mom, I, I'd asked my brother not to come there or my family members to come there because they wanted to be there with me as I said goodbye to mom. And I said, no, I... I would like just some private time with mom. And so I had a great time with mom. And then I went, got in the car, my rental car, and drove down to spend the night in a hotel in Seattle. Because if you drive to Seattle or to the airport in the morning on Interstate 5, it's an hour or two or let me put it this way, it's a little over two hours to get there. That's how bad the commute is in the traffic. And because I had an early morning flight, I really wasn't interested in catching the 4 a.m. shuttle and getting up at 3 o'clock to catch the 4 a.m. shuttle. So I decided I would spend the night in Seattle. So I got in the rent-a-car. I, I drove to the hotel. I'm absolutely exhausted. I have been praying for my family. I've been praying for my mother. I have been asking for God's sustaining grace. If you know my family dynamics, my family depends upon me for a lot. My sister, my brother, it's like I'm now the head of the family and somehow because I'm Mike and Pastor Mike, I know every decision that they need to make and how perfect it is. And then they ask me and I tell them and then they don't listen to me anyway, so I don't know. <laughs> it's exhausting, it is just exhausting. I'm fatigued, I'm burnt out, I'm wiped out. I'm, I'm looking at my clock, I get to the hotel and I think, oh, thank you, God, at least tonight I will have a little bit of sleep 
and I'm just going to be here and pray, and I want to go to bed. I just want to go to bed. In fact, I made a reservation at a Hilton because I thought they're going to have a good bed. And I pull in there, and I check in, and I ask the gal, I said, my car's out there. I said, where do I park? And she says, well, let me call the valet parking over. And I said, valet parking? You mean, I, you know, valet parking? Yeah. I go, well, does that cost money? She goes, yeah. I go, well, how much does it cost? She goes, 40 bucks. I said, um, in the spirit? <laughs> how much does it cost to park by myself? Oh, it's cheaper. How much is it? $38. So I said, well, what am I supposed to do? She says, well, sir, you're downtown. There's no parking here. You're next to the airport. Uh, and the only reason why we charge that is because that's what the parking garage next door to us charges us. So there's no place to park your car. Well, what do I do? I've got this rent-a-car. Well, you can do what a lot of people do. You can take the rent-a-car back, catch the shuttle, go to the airport, go to your gate at the airport, and then step outside and catch another shuttle that's our shuttle that brings you back to the hotel. I'm exhausted, and I said, well, how long does that take? She says, it's not that bad. Most people get it done in an hour and 20, hour and a half. <laughs> oh, Lord, please, I can't do this. I'm fatigued. I just, I just, oh. I, I told the story to Gus, and Gus said, I'd have just paid the 40 bucks. <laughs> That's wisdom speaking right there. So I decide I'm going to return the rental car. So I get back in the car. I'm just, Lord, I'm exhausted. I drive to the place where you return the car. I return the car. The guy, I said, what do I do to get catch the shuttle? He goes, go up that elevator, go on out, go down, and tells me where to go. And he says, and the shuttles are right there. They'll take you to the airport. And then as I start walking to the elevator, he yells back, be sure to catch the right shuttle. Don't get on the wrong one. Get on the right one. Which is the right one? Oh, don't worry about it. You'll see. So I, I follow the directions. I get there. I get on a shuttle, and I'm going, and it looks like progress. We're moving towards the airport, so I think I'm going the right direction. Finally, I, I'm saying, I got to do something here because I don't know how to get from there to wherever I got to go back to the hotel. So I turned to the bus driver and I said, sir, I said, could you please help me? I, I, I'm taking the shuttle to go to the airport because I turned a car, and I want to get on another shuttle that's going to take me to my hotel, which I want to get in and sleep. And he says, ah, don't worry about it. I got you covered. Oh, praise God. So I'm sitting there. Er, he stops. He hasn't gotten into the terminal. He stops before the terminal. <laughs> Doors open up. Okay, here's what you do. You go out the elevator there. You hit the fourth button. Don't hit the fifth. Hit the fourth button. Get out there. You're going to make a right. Now, you're going to go down a corridor. It looks like you're going the wrong way, but you're going the right way. Then when you get at the end of the corridor, there's going to be a skywalk. Don't go right. Go left on the skywalk. Follow it all the way down. You're going to see another elevator. Don't go to the top. Go to the bottom of that elevator. And he starts laying out these directions, and I'm like, Lord, I can't do this. I don't get it. I, oh God, my mind is just like I'm exhausted. So I get off the bus, I'm standing there, and I'm like, oh, Lord, please help me. Please help me. This guy in the back of the bus gets off, and he comes up and he stands next to me. And this is his opening statement to me. Hi. I don't know what's going on, but the Lord just told me to get off the bus with you. What, what? The Lord just told me to get off the bus with you. Do you need help? And I said, oh man, do I need help. <laughs> I, said, I said, do you know where you're going? Do you know your way around here? He says, where do you want to go? He says, I want to go to the Hilton Hotel. He says, oh yeah, follow me. And we start walking. And I start thinking, oh boy. We're going to go somewhere. We're going to walk across a dark parking lot. <laughs> Three or four of his buddies are going to grab me and are going to take the 20 bucks that I have in my, and I'm going to lie there dead in a Seattle parking lot somewhere. I won't even, they'll bury me up there. Nobody will come to my service. It's going to be terrible. 
And so he's walking with me, and then he starts this conversation. What do you do for a living? Now, I never tell people I'm a pastor, and here's the reason why. If I tell them I'm a pastor, it's into the conversation. Oh, you're one of those. It's either, it's either you're a pastor, I'm not going to say anything to you, or it's a pa- you're a pastor, and I'm going to tell you for the next hour and a half in the airplane seat next to you all my problems. And you end up being a counselor for an hour and a half or two hours, or however long your flight is. I don't mind those times. So I said, well, I serve in a lot of capacities, but one of the capacities I serve is I serve on the board of directors for His Healing Hands. And we go around and we do medical mission work. Oh, that's awesome. I'm telling him this story and he says, um, tell me, he says, is it about the medical work or do you also share Jesus when you go? And I go, well, man, the main thing is we share Christ. And the medical work is part of it, but we just use that to tell people about Jesus. Oh, praise God. Now I'm thinking, what's going on here, Lord? You, you sent me somebody, and I, I don't have any idea who it is, but, I, but, but I'm sensing this man knows Christ. So he takes me down this long traverse. We, we come down the elevator finally. The doors open up, and I'm standing right in front of the Hilton Hotel. Pow. And he goes, uh, why are you here? And I said, I'm here to see my mom. I said, why are you here? He said, well, evidently, God had me here to show you how to get to where you don't know how to go. (laughs) But But he said, I just lost my mother, and I came here to do her service. And then he says to me, brother, let me pray for you. And he prays for me. Oh, what is going on? Then he leaves. And I sit down in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel, ever just being prayed for. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Lord, I just asked you before that you would guide and direct me. And you sent to me an unescapable way for me to know that you were going to do that. And the whole time you did that, I was in fear. But listen, people, God has not given us a spirit of fear. In fact, praying in the spirit means we trust him. We believe in him. We don't ask amiss to consume it on our own selfish desires, James says, but we ask in the power of the Spirit, Father, if it be your will. And I asked you, is it your will, Father? Please guide me. And he did. And he reminded me again, as he does every day, I told you I love you. (laughs) I'm just asking you to trust in me. I'll take care of your day. Don't worry about that, Mike. Don't worry about the future. Today's have enough concerns and I'm going to take care of you. And I'm just like, oh, thank you, Father. And I also learned this. Pastors need prayer too. (laughs) And we need a bunch of prayer, don't we? (laughs) Amen. Wow. So I went back up to my room and I could not go to sleep because... (laughs) I was just thanking God and thanking God and saying, praise you, Father, praise you, Father. I'm not done, but I'm done. In fact, I was thinking of that song we sang, Bob, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like mine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. We have Worku and Hallelujah here. They're going to be heading over to Dr. Frankel's class, which is over in our chapel over there. And Warren and I have talked, and one of the things we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to pray for you. We're going to lay our hands on you and we're going to pray for you. We're praying for God's healing is what we're praying for. And uh, I think we're going to do it next Sunday as well. I want, I want you to be prayed over. In fact, some of you have lunch 
and dinner with Worku and Hallelujah this week, pray for them, would you? Just pray a blessing of the Lord on them. Pray that God would sustain you. Pray that God would give you strength. Pray that God would give you healing. The operation is going to cost somewhere between sixty and $75,000. He's not a U.S. citizen. He's from Ethiopia. He doesn't have $75,000. Do you have $75,000? You don't have $75,000. I don't have $75,000. But we're going to work to raise as much money as we can for the glory of God to pay for this man's operation. I don't know how we're going to do it, church. I really don't. But I don't have to worry about that. That's God's problem. And you know what? It ain't a problem for him. If he owns a thousand cattle on the hills, he owns it all. So Lord, use us however you want to use us. In fact, if you want to be a part of that, you can give through OBG and just put on the memo, just put uh, African Pastors Fund and, and we will use that for God's glory and praying for that man. Amen? So, I'm going to close this in prayer. We're not going to sing a closing song. We don't have any time. But we're good. Hallelujah. Come on up here. Pastor Gus, come on up here if you will. I'm just going to ask a blessing. Yeah, bring. Yeah, elders, come on up if you will. If any of our elders, deacons here, some of you church members, come on. Get on up here. Anybody who wants to pray, come on up here. We're going to lay our hands on him and pray for him here. And we're going to pray for him in Sunday school. And we're going to pray for him in second service. And we're going to pray for him every day. And we're going to pray for him all next week. Amen. God wants to do something glorious right here. Yes, yes, Father. Gus, if you could grab that microphone right there behind you. Start. Yes, Father. Oh, Father, we, we come into your presence. Oh, the beauty yes. of your holiness. Yes. And uh, thanking you so much for <sighs> who you are. Thank you for Pastor Mike proclaiming your truth. And we lay our hands on... My dear friend, yes, and Father, we're just asking that you would glorify yourself in his body. Oh, yes, Father, please. We're asking, Father, for the impossible yes. for man. We really can't heal people. You can. Yes, yes. He has dedicated his entire life, his soul, his, his family, his home, his prison time. Everything has been dedicated to you. Yes, Father. Now we ask in the love of Christ that you would touch him. Yes, and heal him. Take this tumor away. Amen. Father, we're just asking you to take the tumor away. Amen. We cannot, and uh, we're just asking a blessing. And then, Father, if money is raised, we'll buy him a car. <laughs> yeah. It would be a great blessing. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We pass this blessing upon him. Holy Spirit, it is you that live in him, and you live in us, and we request this in the love of Jesus the Christ. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for this yes. moment, and we commit them to you. Yes. Thank you for this yes. in his name. Amen. Who else wants to pray? Who else wants to pray? Father, I thank you for this man, and we know the wonders that he's done in Ethiopia. He is a very much respected man. And the reason he's respected as he is, Father, is because his life is your life. He loves you with all of his heart. He loves the people of God. He loves to worship. He loves to teach and preach. His influence goes wide. But why? Because he loves you, Father. And we just ask today that you will touch him right now. You'll take this tumor completely out of his brain, Father. Yes. Relieve him of all the pressure he's under right now. Bless him in a special way today. And yes. be with Hallelujah as well, Father. Yes. This is a burden on her too. This is her man, the man yes. you gave her. And we pray that you be with both of them while they're here. You'll bless them, bless them, and bless them. Oh, yes. And then you'll touch each, each of our hearts yes. to reach out and give as much as we possibly can to help them in this time of need. Father, just bless them in a special way. Yes. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for this wonderful man of God who's become my friend over the years. A great brother in Christ who loves you, who shepherds the flock of God, who serves you, who's been imprisoned for the name of Christ. His body, Father, needs what only you can do, a healing touch. Lord, if it is your will to take that tumor away, do it right now. Just remove it. 
If it's your will, Father, that he goes through surgery and it's removed, then we ask for that. And we don't even know where we're going to get the funds for that, but we're coming to you for that too, Father. So in every way, we're going to be dependent upon you. Help us, Lord. Help us. Heal this man. Show us your grace and your love and your mercy. And Father, even if the unthinkable should happen, I know I'm going to see my brother again. I know I'm going to see him again. But I believe there's many more days ahead for work. Many more days of service. Many more days of worship and prayer. More people need to come to Christ among the Gideo people, Father. Would you grant him those years? We ask this in the name of the one who loves us, Jesus Christ. In the power of the Spirit of God. This is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.